We welcome you to worship this morning at Lake Harbor United Methodist Church on this first Sunday of February, whether you're here in our sanctuary or joining us online today. I'm Pastor Mary Ivanov, and I'm glad to worship with you today. We gather knowing that God's spirit is active in our lives today, and so I'd invite you to stand as you're comfortable here. If you're joining us online, uh, be in a spirit of praise and, and song together, and we'll sing Spirit of the Living God. Uh, two times through, the first time saying fall afresh on us, uh, fall afresh on me, the second time fall afresh on us. Let's sing together. <laughs> Friends, as we gather today, we light our Christ candle and remember the light of Christ that shines in our lives and in the world. We gather in this season of Epiphany when we focus on God coming for all the world and God showing up in our lives in powerful ways. And so that candle is a remembrance for us, a reminder of that for us. And if you're joining us online this morning, I invite you to light a candle or even uh, wherever you are uh, to look at the light and remember God's presence and power. Uh, as we gather today, may the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Again, if you're joining us, you may be seated for those here in the sanctuary. If you're joining us online this morning, I would invite you uh, to let us know you're worshiping with us. Leave a comment, uh, leave a smiley face, a heart. Let us know that, uh, that you are here with us this morning. It is good to gather together. I want to just invite you uh, to hear a couple of announcements. First of all, an invitation. If you have prayer requests to share uh, or God moments, those moments of God's grace in your life that you want to share, I invite you to send them in. Uh, to our office email that's on the screen here, office at lakeharborumc.org. Uh, that's a wonderful way for us to share together and communicate together. A reminder for this afternoon, uh, you'll see a slide here. Uh, this afternoon, uh, 3 o'clock here in the sanctuary, we're going to be showing the film To Kill a Mockingbird that uh, we're sort of using as a jumping off point for this series. So we'd invite you to come and enjoy that time this afternoon here in our sanctuary. Uh, reminders for all the opportunities that we have this week going on. Uh, grief share on Monday night, Bible studies on Tuesday uh, morning, Tuesday evening, and Saturday morning. Uh, this Tuesday night also, uh, we have our worship brainstorming time, uh, our next worship brainstorming for Lent, which is going to be a series on the Psalms. And so we'll meet downstairs in our fellowship hall at 6 o'clock uh, for a potluck. And then at 7 o'clock, we'll start our brainstorming time. So uh, all are welcome to come to that. Uh, those are really wonderful times to share and uh, grow together and uh, do the work that we do together to prepare for worship. So uh, we invite you to be part of that. Uh, even if, you, if it's your first time, we would love to have you join us for this special time together. 
Uh, youth group will meet on Wednesday. On Thursday morning, our uh, MNO group, which stands for Membership, Nurture, and Outreach, will gather to uh, prepare some special Valentines for our homebound members and friends. Uh, and again, if you want to uh, offer some of those, we, we would love your help. Or you can come and help us uh, pack those and then deliver them as well. Our social justice group will meet Thursday night. And then this coming Friday is the chili cook-off uh, put on by our high school youth as they um, raise funds for their mission trip this summer that uh, we hope will happen to Henderson Settlement in Kentucky. That's the plan. So uh, we're moving forward and, and uh, getting excited for that. Next Sunday when we gather uh, is the Super Bowl. Some of you who watch football would probably know that. Uh, but it's also going to be the Super Bowl here, S-O-U-P-E-R. So we're collecting cans of soup to support our local community. They'll both support Hand to Hand, uh, which we're partnering with Temple United Methodist Church to provide chicken noodle soup uh, for people in need, for children in need. And also we'll support MAPS Food Pantry. So uh, if you can pick up some soup this week, that will be a wonderful way for us uh, to, gather, to gather those things and, and help our community. I also want to just simply lift up, uh, as we move into a new month, we move into a new focus for a social justice issue. And this month, it's literacy. Uh, you'll hear a little bit more later uh, in the message, but uh, thinking about how we can support efforts uh, for um, better literacy in our community for all ages. Uh, I was just at a, a meeting this week uh, having some conversations with, with some others about that. So. Um, I'm excited to think about how we can do that together, how we can support efforts that are already going on. And for those of us who've been involved in Ross Park Readers, uh, that continued need in our schools uh, is always an opportunity. So uh, as we're getting back into to that opportunity, uh, I would just invite you to be in prayer and uh, just be aware of, of the things that you read or the things that you see uh, where we can connect. So as we... Uh, start this new series. Over the past few years, some of you know that we've offered what we call a faith in film series, um, using films as a jumping off point to talk about our faith. This month, it's a similar idea, uh, but with a twist, though more of looking at faith through literature and story, namely To Kill a Mockingbird, a book written by Harper Lee, published in 1960. Harper Lee was connected to a Methodist church in Alabama, her story is one of the most beloved and sometimes most contested and controversial books in modern literature. The film adaptation followed in 1962 and continues to be on many greatest film lists. Uh, people usually can't think about Gregory Peck without thinking about Atticus Finch and that role that he played. Pastor Matt Rall, who is a pastor in Louisiana, uh, has used the story as an invitation to explore Christian faith, theology, and ethics in a study that he called The Faith of a Mockingbird. So each week, we'll focus on a different character in the story and how that character helps us understand ourselves and our faith. And today we focus on Scout Finch, the narrator, the child narrator, who tells the story of her life and community. So we'll show a short clip during worship each week, but because of copyright, we're not able to live stream it. The link for you to watch uh, online is available. I sent that out yesterday. So for those joining on our live stream, uh, you're going to have about three minutes this morning of a little bit of a break. Uh, but for those here in the sanctuary, I would invite you to take a look at this clip from the beginning of the story where we meet Scout, her father Atticus, and her brother Jen. Take a look.
So you know from the outset that Scout is not afraid to ask questions about anything, about why people do what they do, about socioeconomic stuff happening in the community, and I hope you heard the shout out to the Methodists at least three times in that clip. Scout's connected to her family and community, which plays a big part in how she responds to what's happening around her, especially what's unknown, what's difficult, what's new. And so uh, as we come together today, that serves as a jumping off point for how we think about the stories we tell, the questions we have, and the faith we claim. So we gather with questions too as we worship God together. We gather to remember our story as a part of God's story of love and grace. So would you stand as you're able, and I'll invite Dave Lorenz to come forward and call us to worship. We have come to worship God, the living God. Who calls prophets and teachers to bear witness. We have come to praise God, the almighty God. Who answers the forces of hatred and hurt. Who chooses even you and me to receive and carry the word of life and hope. Glory, Glory to God. God. And would you remain standing as you're able? We'll sing the first four verses of Amazing Grace. And you may be seated. I want to invite those who are young and young at heart to pay close attention this morning, uh, just for a moment. Uh, so I uh, invite you to say good morning here in the count three, and we'll greet those who are joining us online. How about that? Uh, and we'll uh, know that they're saying good morning back to us. Let's say good morning. Count of three. One, two, three. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Uh, how many of you have questions? Anybody have questions? Anybody curious about some things that don't seem to have easy answers? I wonder if any of you watching ever have questions. How many of you have ever had hard questions? Difficult questions? How many of you have ever asked a question and never got the answer? Me too. So I was thinking about a time, um, I was probably eight, and I say that because I, I'm guessing it, it had to be a year, with, uh, a year when we were going to elect a president. So I was born in 1976, and I'm guessing it was probably 1984 when this happened. Um, I went to the church in my town, the United Methodist Church, and one of my pastors, his name was Pastor Bob. 
And I really liked Pastor Bob, and I had a really important question to ask him one day at church. And so um, I asked him who he was going to vote for in the presidential election. I don't remember this, but it's a story my mom likes to tell often. Now, I never got the answer. He never told me, but I really wanted to know. And um, for those of you listening, it might not have been the best question to ask. Sometimes people don't share all their views around politics and presidents and things like that. But I was curious. I really wanted to know. And he didn't get angry or anything, but just didn't e answer exactly what I wanted to know. I think he just sort of listened and kind of went on and probably changed the subject. Now, I want you all to know something that I don't always share, but it's really, really true. I have a lot of questions, too. I have a lot of questions for God, like why bad things happen and why there are some people who are struggling and some who don't and why the world is the way it is. I have a lot of questions. And there are times when you've asked questions and you've asked me questions, written me notes and said, uh, asked some hard questions, and the answer is that I don't really know. I don't always know the answer. But I hope you'll keep asking because questions are a part of the way that we make sense of the world. And it's part of how we're connected to each other. Asking questions and having those conversations is really, really important. And today we're going to read a scripture a little later that reminds us that we really do need each other. Uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul, talks about the family of God and compares it to the body, like our human bodies, and all the parts of our bodies. So, uh, and one of the questions he asks, he says, what if everything was an eye? Where would the hearing be? And so if we think about that in all the different parts of the body that we have, and all the different things that they do, it's pretty amazing. And if we think about that, like Paul says, like all of us, like the body of Christ, when we think about all the gifts and special things that people do and the, the, the skills they share and the gifts they share, it reminds us that we really do need each other. We're all connected. We need one another for uh, the fullness, to know the fullness of, of who God is. So I was thinking about the song, and for those of you who are here, you can just uh, do this where you're sitting. But if you're at home and, and want to try this, um, anybody remember head, shoulders, knees, and toes? Yeah. So we're going to do it just quickly. Yeah. Here, somebody's already doing it in the back. All right. So here we go. Head, shoulders, knees, and toes, knees, and toes. Head, shoulders, knees, and toes, knees, and toes. Eyes, and ears, and mouth, and nose. Head, Shoulders, knees, and toes, knees, and toes. So, I didn't go down far enough, sorry. There you go. So, as we're thinking about that, as we, and as you hear the scripture today, I want you to, um, even if you hear Paul say, where, uh, if everything were an eye, where would the hearing be? I want you to, to touch those parts as we're reading today. And remember that every part is really important, just like every one of us is really important. We need each other to figure things out. And even to say that we don't know sometimes. We need each other to make things happen. How many people it takes to plan for worship, to plan Sunday school, to plan vacation Bible school, to plan the things that we do together. We need each other to learn and grow and to appreciate how amazing God is, that God is our creator. God has made each one of us unique. And if I think about the skills and the gifts that you have, the people in this room and those of you who might be watching with us this morning, some of you are really, really really good artists. You love to color and draw. Some of you love to build Legos. Some of you love to dance or read or play sports. All those are special things that you can do. And it reminds me that each of us is unique. Each of us is part of the body. And God needs all of us to share the skills we have. And God keeps, wants us to keep asking questions. That's part of how we learn. It's part of how we grow. It's part of how we understand who God is and what the world is like. So as you're thinking about the questions you have, maybe you could write them down. If you're watching today and you have the big questions, feel free to write them in the comments this morning. Uh, and let's keep asking those questions and thinking about who God is and who we are together. So let's pray this morning. God, thank you for all the gifts that you've given us, for all the, the things that we love to do and the things that bring us joy. Thank you, too, for the ways that you keep reminding us that we can ask the questions that we have. And sometimes they're big questions and they're difficult questions and they don't always have a clear
clear answer, but you want us to keep asking them and keep working to understand who we are and who we're called to be as people who love you and love Jesus. So be with us and help us to ask those questions every day and know that uh, sometimes even when we don't get the answers, the questions are important and they help us learn and grow. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, and our friend. Amen. All right, get to do the God moment. I always say get to, even though it's, you know, one of those things. Um, yeah, I'm sure you're like me. You, you find many times during the week you just find yourself kind of saying, thank you, God. Thank you, God. So many times, so many things happen. Um, and then even just now, when I was reading this, it's thank you, God. You, you read the, the line, it says, did I let go of my anger and resentment? Gallup, I was just reading a study this last week. They said Gallup surveyed Americans, and they said that 42% of Americans said that they spent a significant amount of time the previous day in anger. And I have this theory, and I'm always thinking about it these days, that that the pandemic has separated us, it's split us apart, and it's caused all these anxieties and fears and distrust issues and, and anger. And, you know, we need to come together. So yesterday, yesterday I, uh, I was in Sault Ste. Marie. I, I don't know why, I don't know why I'm feeling this way. And uh, I, I had the pleasure of going on the ice uh, for the I-500 snowmobile race, it's the, the fastest, you know, snowmobile race in America. It's, it's a mile-long loop, and it's, a, it's really cool. Even the way it came together, five guys over a cup of coffee 55 years ago with this idea of doing something to, to bring people together in their community in the wintertime. So I was on the ice, and I got to hold this huge flag, as big as our sanctuary here. So I was one of many people that I haven't seen for a long time. And I just thought, wow, this brought us together again. This, this thing in the wintertime, it was 16 below yesterday morning in Sault Ste. Marie. I think I was wearing 16 layers of clothes, and I was still cold. So here we are, an opportunity to come together again. These people I haven't seen for two years. And I just said, thank you, God. I'll say it again today. Thank you, God. As we come to a time of offering together, I want to uh, offer a couple words of thanks uh, first to our worship team for their work in preparing for this series uh, and in everything we have up here visually and creatively. Uh, I also want to thank many people who helped to provide the Ministry of Hospitality for a memorial service held here at uh, our church this week. Every gift of time and talent, every creative idea, all of it matters. Uh, and it's uh, a real blessing to our mission and ministry together. Uh, as we enter this new month, I want to remind you again of uh, opportunities for special giving that we have beyond our regular giving that supports the mission ministry of the church. Again, uh, I mentioned next week is the Super Bowl of Caring. We continue to collect uh, small cans of chicken noodle soup for hand-to-hand -hand, uh, in cooperation with Temple United Methodist Church. And in February, our noisy offering uh, will support um, the efforts of uh, dancing with the local stars and their efforts to support lo local food pantries. We have uh, some people who are uh, closely connected to that who are members of this congregation. We have a couple folks who are dancing this year as well. So uh, we want to, to join with them in their efforts um, to, to help our local food pantries. And, and all the funds raised uh, go right to that. So we're thankful for that as well. So keep that in mind for our noisy offering. Uh, during this time of offering, I would invite you to prepare uh, your regular offering, to send it in, uh, to go online to our website if you want to give that way, lakeharborumc.org. Uh, and th during this time, uh, we have, as Dave mentioned, we have uh, God moments that we share each week. They're always a blessing to us. Uh, some of them are, are spoken, some of them are written down. So you'll see those that were sent in this week during this time of offering. Uh, I would encourage you to write one down, to send it in. They really are a way that we witness together and build community together. Uh, so let's take this time 
give thanks to God and uh, offer our hearts. Let's worship. Let us pray. Creator God, we need Christ, each of us, all of us. Today we want to be especially aware that we are all one body in Christ. When one part of the body is hurting, the whole body is wounded. When healing happens, the whole body is blessed. May our giving bring love to the parts of Christ's body that are feeling unloved and forgotten. And may it bring justice and mercy to those parts that are oppressed and burdened. In our giving, may we find the joy of blessing the whole body of Christ. In his holy name we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. As we come to the scripture today, I'm going to invite Dave to share this with me. This comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning with verse 4. There are different spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are different ministries and the same Lord. And there are different activities, but the same God who produces all of them in everyone. A demonstration of the Spirit is given to each person for the common good. A word of wisdom is given by the Spirit to one person, a word of knowledge to another according to the same Spirit, faith to still another by the same Spirit, gifts of healing to another in the one Spirit, performance of miracles to another, prophecy to another, the ability to tell spirits apart to another, different kinds of tongues to another, and the interpretation of the tongues to another. All these things are produced by the one and same Spirit who gives what he wants to each person. Christ is just like the human body. A body is a unit and has many parts, and all the parts of the body are one body, even though there are many. We were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jew or Greek or slave, 
or free, and we're all given one spirit to drink. Certainly the body isn't one part, but many. If the foot says, I'm not a part of the body because I'm not a hand, does that mean it's not part of the body? If the ear says, I'm not a part of, part of the body because I'm not an eye, does that mean it's not part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, what would happen to the hearing? And if the whole body were an ear, what would happen to the sense of smell? But as it is, God has placed each one of the parts in the body just like he wanted. If all were one and the same body part, what would happen to the body? But as it is, there are many parts, but one body. So the eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. Or in turn, the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. Instead, the parts of the body that people think are the weakest are the most necessary. The parts of the body that we think are less honorable are the ones we honor the most. The private parts of the body that aren't presentable are the ones that are given the most dignity. The parts of our body that are presentable don't need this. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the part with less honor, so that there won't be division in the body, and so the parts might have mutual concern for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. If one part gets glory, all the parts celebrate with it. And I would invite you to read that last sentence with me. You are the body of Christ and parts of each other. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I'm going to invite you to see a short video this morning as an introduction. story. Let us pray. God, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Friends, I'm excited for this series and have been challenged all over again by Harper Lee's story and how she puts themes like justice, mercy, mystery, and love in our faces so that we have to look at ourselves and our lives. I loved this book when I read it in high school. It was memorable and meaningful and sometimes uncomfortable. And uh, as part of getting ready for this series, I reached out to some of my dear friends. Uh, we went to high school together and I asked them for their responses or their remembrances of this book. And some of what we had was deeply shared, that it was a meaningful book for us, that it made us think. Uh, and that's a powerful thing that literature can do. Uh, Harper leaves life in Monroeville, Alabama, and her Methodist Christian faith reflects in the story and calls us to consider who we are, how we're a part of God's bigger story, and how we keep a hopeful faith in a broken world. We look at ourselves and our lives through God's story of redemption, hope, and love, or at least that's the invitation from God as we follow Christ. With all that that's swirling around us, there are times when God's grace shows through stories, art, music, movies, and other cultural parts and pieces. Even this week, God showed up powerfully in a two-minute segment on a late-night talk show when, when musician Dua Lipa asked host Stephen Colbert to talk about the connection between his faith and comedy. Colbert had heard that... Uh, 
Dua Lipa really loved to interview people. She liked to have conversation. And so she, he gave her the chance to, to ask him a question. And so she asked him about how his uh, faith intersects with his comedy. And so he, uh, he's always been open about his faith before. And he did say that he hopes Jesus has a sense of humor. That's true. But then he got more serious and was very clear about how his faith calls him to values of love and sacrifice. And he offered a powerful witness. He said this, death is not defeat. And that laughter and humor can overcome fear. It's moments like that when the line between sacred and secular blurs. And we understand transformation in a new way. It was two minutes, but it was a powerful two minutes television, a powerful witness. By God's grace, we experience moments when God is so close we can feel it and we're inspired to keep going. That's what our God moments are. I heard another inspiring story about Dylan Helbig, a second grader from Idaho, who wrote a handmade book, 81 pages. He took a red notebook and wrote 81 pages, complete with illustrations, and he snuck it onto a shelf when he went to his local library. The Adventures of Dylan Helbig's Christmas by Dylan himself, the front said, wasn't on the shelf when Dylan went back to look for it after he told his mom what he did and they decided they better go find it. And it's become a hit. The one copy now has a legitimate barcode and a waiting list for checkout. All because Dylan wanted to share his story with the world. Dylan, the adventures of Dylan Helbig's Christmas. And I want to tell you that Christmas is spelled C-R-I-S-M-I-S. That's spectacular. He just put it on the shelf. What a move. It's inspiring and challenging as we think about telling our stories. So In To Kill a Mockingbird Scout is our narrator. Some of you may have read the book more recently or a long time ago, but she's the narrator, looking back, I think, from an adult voice. But she's young. As the narrator, she's young, very bright, very observant, and very, very honest. She's making her way in the world along with her brother, Jem, and Atticus, who, her widower father, who is an attorney in their small town. Atticus is patient with Scout's questions and attentive to her wonderings. His respect for, for his children is clear, even as he'd like to spare them the difficulties of life. Part of the power of this story is that it's told from a child's point of view. Its honesty and innocence move us deeply. When I asked my sister, who uh, now just retired from teaching English uh, in middle school, why this, power, this story is so powerful, that's what she said. It's about a young child figuring things out in the world. If it were told from a different character's perspective, it would be different, and maybe it wouldn't be so beloved. Even as scripture is the inspired word of God, we know it represents the work of many different authors. We have four Gospels. Four books that tell us the story of Jesus' birth, life, ministry, death, and resurrection. When we read them all, we understand that they tell the same story with maybe a different emphasis in each. The basics are the same to be sure, but Matthew wants us to know that Jesus is the Messiah and takes great length to make sure we know Jesus' family history. Mark is sparse on the details, but probably was written down first and was the source material for at least Matthew and Luke. Luke is a Gentile who writes from that perspective and includes more stories about how Jesus reaches out to Gentiles. John's gospel is very different from the others, starting with a wider scope. In the beginning was the word. A wider scope and offering longer encounters with specific people like Nicodemus and the woman at the well. Each gospel offers a unique perspective on the story of Jesus, on the good news of God for the world. Each of them is important, even though we might have a favorite. I've told you before, Luca's name will tell you which one mine is. Each of us has a unique experience of God and a unique role in telling God's story. Maybe there's a part of the gospel that resonates with you and moves you deeply. 
We find ourselves in the gospel story, and God uses our perspective to tell the story. Some of you may have seen the Broadway musical Hamilton in its run in so many different places over the last few years. There's a line in one of the songs that says, Who lives, who dies, who tells your story? It's a question that's asked, but it's a good question. Who tells your story? Each week of this series, I'll offer some questions that we can respond to, maybe even on social media, as a way to tell our stories. So the first one you'll see here. How do your daily habits reveal your faith and your values? It occurred to me as I listened to that interview uh, from the, the late night talk show this week that that's really what that was about. What are your faith? What are your faith and values? How do they look in your life? And then another one that you might respond to, for what do you give thanks? I promise we don't plan this stuff. Dave's God moment is a perfect example. The Holy Spirit is working all the time to help us make those connections. Just like the body has many parts that are important to the whole, our experiences of coming to faith in Jesus and living our faith are important Paul's word to the community affirms that everyone and every story has value. We truly need each other to get the most complete understanding of who God is and what God is like. In the story that we're using as this sort of jumping off point, Scout is learning her place in the community as she stands against the norms for a young girl. She doesn't really love to wear dresses. She'd rather run around in her overalls. She's learning her place as she asks honest and hard questions. And you heard some of that in the clip. Are we poor? Are they poor? And there are more that she asks. She's learning her place as she tries to understand justice and seeks to make sense of the world. Even with the blessing of understanding that those stories that we have, even the story of scripture told from those different perspectives, with the blessing of that comes a caution. Scripture is living and active, we're told, and it always meets us where we are. But I think it begs some questions for us. What are the stories that we tell ourselves about God? Are they true? We know people who struggle to believe that God really loves them because of painful life experiences or because someone made Christ's love out to be conditional rather than unconditional and gracious and steadfast. What are the stories we tell about others? You ever told a story about somebody and been wrong? We'll get to some of that in this story, too. Harper Lee's story reminds us that our prejudices and assumptions and sometimes what, we tell, what others tell us aren't the truth. The children's constant wonder and the community gossip about Boo Radley, along with the very public trial of Tom Robinson, challenge us to consider who we're listening to and how we seek truth. When do we come to the place where we understand that the world isn't idyllic? It's not perfect. Do you remember those moments when you realize as a child things aren't perfect? This is difficult. When it feels like evil will win, how do we respond? How do we hold the brokenness around us and still live with the hope that God is at work for good, that God is doing a new thing? That death is not defeat. We talk about our own stories, but what about our story as a community of faith? For more than 65 years now, we've been here making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Some of us have been here for a long time, some of us not so long. But no matter the timeline, we're called to use the gifts we have, each of us uniquely gifted as a part of the body of Christ, to serve God, to serve others. Our role is to offer Christ's love, to tell the story of God's grace. We do that now in many ways. I could make a long, long list, but I want to highlight one that was particularly powerful for me this week. I was especially moved at our grief share meeting on Monday night when we sat back here in the sanctuary and the Holy Spirit's presence was very real 
in the community of people who were gathered, none of us knowing one another well, but called together in the midst of different grief journeys. It's amazing how God keeps transforming us as we connect to each other, as we hear one another's stories. As I mentioned a little earlier, I attended a luncheon this week uh, sponsored by the United Way in town for faith partners, where the focus was literacy and what the church can do to partner with our community to reach out and help people who need help. We have some things in place already through our ministry, like Ross Park Readers. But there are others I know who do things in the community and other places and other connections. And there may be some opportunities for us to help adults who struggle with reading and literacy, maybe more than we realize. It's an opportunity, and I'll be sharing more as I get more information. But what is God calling us to do to continue to share the story of God's grace in new ways. You may have a vision and dream for a new thing that God is doing, that God has laid on your heart. If you do, share it. Scouts' willingness to ask hard questions can inspire us to ask them too, especially as we seek to understand God's will and way and how we might be open to God's leading to places we did not expect. We do it together, and we do it as we nurture our relationship with God. Dave offered a word from the handout that we have today. This will be posted on our Facebook page as well, but I'd invite you uh, to look at the questions that are asked there. These come from Henry Nowen. How do your daily habits reveal your faith and values? That's the question for us, but these are questions from him. Did I offer peace today? Did I bring a smile to someone's face? Did I say words of healing? Did I let go of my anger and resentment? Did I forgive? Did I love? These are the real questions. Ultimately, our story begins with brokenness and struggle. The story of faith can begin that way, but that's not how it ends. There is healing and grace and resurrection, and we're called to be part of that story. Even as we come to the table where bread is broken for us and the love of God is poured out for us, we know that broken bread and the, bro the cup of salvation offer us new life and hope. There are many connections that we have with others, and sometimes those connections bring expectations for who we are, how we are, and what our place is. Today, we're offered a reminder when we come to the table of whose we are and the place where we find rest and peace and grace. It's a holy meal, a holy moment when we remember our part in God's bigger story of grace and love that offers redemption and ultimately promises redemption for the whole world that God loves. And so I would invite you to pray with me this morning as we come to the table. Dear God, we come with a spirit of humility, repentance, and thanksgiving. Compassionate God, have mercy on us, we pray. You call us to examine our thoughts, our actions, our motives, and our attitudes towards others. Holy God, have mercy and forgive us for our shortcomings. Help us to remember our responsibility to our families and our neighbors, our stewardship to you and the work you have given to our hands. Guide us, awaken us, energize us for all that's ahead. O oh, living God, we stand in need of your grace, strength, and mercy. As we eat this bread, open our eyes to recognize the intimacy that you yearn to share with us. O oh, loving God, Teach us to love you above all else, even above our ambitions. As we drink the cup, we thank you for the new covenant, love one another, which is written on our hearts. Help us to live it out. Tender God, may your great sacrifice of redeeming love renew us for loving service and for sacrifice for others. And there is good news as we come to God in faith and trust.
as we offer our heartfelt confession. We celebrate God's grace, that Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That is proof of God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. And I would invite us to listen to these words. Uh, this is a song called In Remembrance of Me. And I would invite us into a time of prayer this morning as we come to the table. Friends, the Lord be with you. Also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. Before the mountains were brought forth, or you had formed the earth from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You created light out of darkness and brought forth life on the earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, in whom you have revealed yourself, our light and our salvation. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. 
delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. It was on the night that he gave himself up for us that Jesus took bread. He gave thanks to you, O God. He broke the bread. He gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took a cup. He gave thanks to you, O God, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we would be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. We offer our prayers this morning for ourselves, for our loved ones, for our community, for our church family, for our nation, for our world. Hear our prayers, O God. We give you thanks for the blessing of prayer in our lives. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one, in, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Friends, I would invite you to take and eat and take and drink this morning the bread of life and the cup of salvation. We'll sing one verse of one bread and one body together. pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this holy meal, this holy mystery in which you give yourself to us, in which you strengthen us to serve you in the world. Guide us and help us, we pray, in the name and spirit of Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, would you stand as you're able and we'll sing together, bind us together as we go from here this morning.
Let's go from here, strengthened and nourished to serve God and others every day. Go in the love of God, the grace of Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit, to live and love. Go in peace and make peace. Amen. Thank you.